We now have uh, the final presentation or speech, uh, final plenary session of the, the conference. And uh, it's one that I must say that I personally am very much looking forward to, to hearing. Our final keynote speaker is Ao Xiang Yi, who is somebody who's been here throughout and observing and participating actively in this conference. And I've learned only here at the end the extent to which he's embedded in uh, many of the things that have been happening uh, in this country here over the years. He is currently, though, a senior water specialist at the Manila-based Asian Development Bank, ADB, in the East Asia Department and responsible for leading design, processing, and implementing of loan projects and technical assistance pro programs in the People's Republic of China and Mongolia. Prior to joining the ADB, he worked on a range of water infrastructure, policy, and strategic planning roles with the Queensland governments and in consultancy, and, and has had off, very obviously a, a great interaction with many of the people who are participating here at this conference in previous um, employment activities. He has a PhD in resource economics from Central Queensland University and qualifications in civil engineering and business management from the University of Queensland. Sean, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the last session, but you know, the last but not least. There's still a lot more to come. You know, this is always always tough uh, following the act that we had this morning with uh, Leif and Carly, but but I'll try my best. So, firstly, I want to want to thank uh, Eva and the team, the International River Foundation, the board, for the invitation for this uh, honor to to be back here with friends to deliver this keynote to. To you all. Uh, the International River Symposium, I, I've had the opportunity to be involved with for many years, uh, attending, participating, uh, but, but uh, I wouldn't have thought I'd be, be, be asked to come back to do keynote, so, so I'm, I'm very honored. Uh, before I start, uh, I do want to thank uh, and res pay respect to the traditional owners, the uh, Jaguar and the Turbo people, uh, pay respects to the, to the elders, past, president, and, and emerging, and uh, I, I want to commend. Uh, uh, the, the event for, for putting on this, this cultural, this fourth dimension uh, that, that's often missing in a lot of these, uh, these events. The cultural dimension, the learnings uh, from, from the first peoples, from the early civilizations, and I'll, I'll touch a bit on that in my presentation, is absolutely key because uh, they've done this for a lot longer than we have, believe it or not. Uh, although we, we've recorded it, but they, they've really been around for a long time. They know how to do it. And in fact, a lot of the work that we're doing now is trying to look back and understand what has been done. So without further ado, let me introduce to you uh, the talk today. So what I've, what I've titled is Valuing Our Rivers, the case study that Asian Development Bank and, and myself being privileged to, to lead that program and coordinate that program for our department in the Yangtze River Basin. I'll first start with a brief introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll start with what ADB does uh, for a start. I'll, I'll take you through some of the environment challenges in China. Uh, what is this thing called the Yangtze River Economic Belt? It's, it's something new, but I think it's something different. And I think it's going to be something that will change the way that many people and any, many countries redefine what is river basin management. Uh, ADB's integrated framework approach our $2 billion program currently assisting the Chinese government in, in trying to tackle the issues in the Yangtze. I'll, I'll talk about this very innovative uh, policy mechanism that is called ecological compensation. Now this hasn't had a lot of air time in the, in the literature, but I can assure you it's been around for some time and, and the Chinese are, are working very hard to, to get, this, get, get this experiment mainstreamed. And, and then we'll do a bit of stock taking and looking forward. Where to from here, I guess. So, firstly, I'll, I'll have to give uh, my, my, uh, my employee a bit of a plug. So what is the Asian Development Bank? So many, pe many people I, I, I speak to, um, I talk about, yeah, I work for the Asian Development Bank. Uh, I'm convinced they think I work as a teller. I'm convinced they think I sit behind a, sit behind a counter and I, I, I deal out financing for, for loans, which is half, half correct. 
So the IDB is what we call one of the international financial institutions. They're the, one of the um, multilateral development banks. It was founded 52, 53 years ago in 1966. Uh, we have a very honorable mission, and a mission that, that's quite dear to my heart, and, uh, and essentially it's a vision to try to eradicate poverty in the Asia Pacific area. We have now 68 members. We just added another one uh, in one, one of the South Pacific countries. We just added to so now 68. Uh, 49 of them are in our region, 19 are non-regional. So we have, we have members from Europe, for example, and the, the United States and other places. So it's based in Manila. So that's, that's why I'm in Manila. Uh, I'm not based in China, I'm based in Manila, but I'm working currently on the, on the China desk. Uh, we've got 32 field officers across our uh, field, field of operations. So what we do, we, we do provide loans. Uh, essentially concessional products, concessional, uh, concessional loans to governments, sovereign governments, uh, with, the, with the idea to try to help them catalyze their development outcomes, to, to reach their development outcomes. So we give them concessional uh, lending, we give them grants, we give them technical assistance to help deliver their, their development outcomes, their, their development aspirations, if you will. Uh, to give you some context, we're, we're a small regional bank compared to the others, like the World Bank and, and the Europeans and, and a few others, but, but in 2018, uh, our assistance was around 22 billion US dollars. So it's, it's still quite significant, and, and this is an area where, where my work, I find, can do a lot of impact. And, and it's, it's, quite, it's quite heartening, and I'm very, very uh, privileged to be in that position to, to be able to design programs that impacts this level of, uh, of uh, populations and peoples. This is a bit of corporate stuff for ADB, but I have to mention it. We have a strategy 2030 vision. We focus on seven core operational areas. Uh, I'll, I'll let you look at them, but essentially what, what area I'm in is, is in this uh, top right corner, the climate change, disaster resilience, and environmental sustainability. This is, this is where the water, water cuts through. Water cuts through, cuts through quite a few of these areas, but this is the area that we're focusing on in particular in, in my work. Let's look at China. Well, uh, environment and climate change are, are one of the key priority areas in, in, the, in the assistance that, that the ADB is involved with in China. And, 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 it's, no, and it's, it's, hard to, it's, it's not hard to see why. We, we've heard about the, the rapid development that they've gone through in the last uh, three or four decades since the, the official opening up. Uh, in the environment, we're looking at air, water, soil pollution, and climate change stress, we've got water security and food safety. I mean, a lot of these issues are, are no different to what we're facing here in, in the Australian context, no doubt, and, and in many other countries. Now, the Yangtze Basin. Now, this, this one is a, I'll spend a few minutes on this one because this is really something that provides some context. The Yangtze River Basin is, is what China calls its, its mother river. It's, it's home to almost half of the half of the population. I mean, it's something like in the order of 590 million people. Uh, it's the largest river system in China, and in fact in Asia, and worldwide it's the third largest system, or third longest system as well, if you look at it in that respect. Globally significant biodiversity, and, and I've just got a few notes here that I'll, I think we'll need to share just to give, give you the context. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, it's home to 400 different kinds of birds, 350 species of fish, some are endemic to just the upper Yangtze River, 280 species of mammals, and, and unfortunately, because of the economic development and the pace of growth, a lot of, a lot of these species and biodiversity loss has been, has been quite widespread. Chinese river dolphin, a few species, species of which has been uh, declared extinct, which is quite a shame. Uh, we have the Chinese alligator, and of course the, the giant panda, WWF symbol. Uh, 95% of the wintering Siberian crane is supported by the Yangtze River Basin. So this, this, this is really a biodiversity hotspot. It's got world heritage uh, areas declared. But on the other hand, it's also facing a lot of challenges. So, so the river is sick. It's, it's in poor shape. And it's poor shape because of the nature of the development that has driven a lot of uh, reductions in poverty, uh, rising incomes. However, the disparity from the coastal areas from Shanghai through to the 11 provinces and two special cities that it, that it uh, traverses 
is quite, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a contrast. So, so for example, in Shanghai, compared to some of the provinces in the, the western side, you know, like Weiyang and, and Yunnan, it's something to the order of four to five times GDP per capita. So that gives you a feel for the disparities. It's, it's very much two separate, two separate countries in many respects. You've got a very rich, uh, high-income coastal province, and then you've got very poor uh, rural areas that, that are really in need for basic sanitation, basic wastewater management, and that's, that's what ADB's support is focused on, on the, on the middle and upper reaches. Uh, now, the other thing I wanted to share with you is the, the Yangtze River Basin is, is seen as the future growth engine for the country. Uh, President Xi has, has outlined a very, very prominent uh, philosophy. Uh, in 2016, he came out and said, we need to develop what we call an ecological civilization. Now, this, this sounds like quite, quite uh, you know, it's quite fluffy when I first heard it, but really when you, you look at how they uh, inculcated the, the philosophy throughout the planning documents, the regulations, it, it is quite impressive. They've, they structured it and they've regulated it in a way that ecological and green growth and green development has to underline everything. So we need to look at carrying capacity before anything else. So this is quite a paradigm shift in terms of where the development has taken place. In the past, it's been big development chemical industries, you know, growth, basically, you know, coal, fire plants, and all sorts of stuff. No doubt some of them are still there, but they are making a lot of inroads in terms of trying to reduce and shift it to a more green path. He's, he's, he's also mentioned this uh, twin mountain theory. Uh, so some of you may, may have heard of this, if you're familiar with the Chinese literature. So he's, he's famously quoted to say, uh, green mountains are gold mountains. So this is the twin mountain theory. Of course, green and gold, we Aussies already knew, knew about green and gold long ago, but, uh, but this, is, this is really something that's taken, taken root in, at the very core of the Chinese uh, planning philosophy, and, and they've seen the Yangtze River Belt as a way to operationalize that. The other thing I should mention is this, this region here represents the third largest economy in the world. It's, it's large, uh, larger than Japan and larger than Canada. So, so not just domestically it's vital for the economic development of the, the country, it's also globally uh, significant. Now, they have a planning, planning structure where they've, they've tried to say that by 2035, they'll have what they call a basic framework for ecological civilization. And they've also noted that by 2030, they want the Yangtze River system to be to be in pretty good shape, and they've got some, some targets which I'll get down to later on. Okay, now the next, the next point that I wanted to mention is, um, I, I haven't sort of mentioned it too much, but basically the idea of a, a belt. Now this is, this is the planning model that, that really is quite unique, and, and we, we find that this will be a new way of defining river basin management. So, so the belt doesn't look at just the river doesn't look at just the, the biophysical aspects, but it looks at how managing these biophysical aspects influence other things. So, so I guess you could talk about the triple bottom line. You have the economic aspects, social, uh, environmental, cultural. But they also look at things beyond the basin. So for example, uh, air sheds within the basin that inf impact on air pollution in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, for that matter. That's, that's included in this, this understanding of the belt. Uh, of course, there's the, the focus on what they call high quality development. High quality meaning green development. Moving, moving to a more cleaner path. They've realized that they can't just keep flogging the resources that they've, that they've used to, to create this rapid rise in incomes. They can't keep going on that. And, and that's, that's quite heartening to, 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 to know, and, and that's something that they really emphasize in our discussions with them, that all of our work has to support a new path for green development. And that's, that's, quite, that's quite new, because this is coming from the top. And it's a, in many ways a bit of a golden age for working on the environment and river basin work in China, because the government is behind it. it it's a, obviously a command economy, so we, we are taking the benefits of this, uh, of this structural direction and trying to make it work with our program. And, and ultimately, using this belt, it allows us to spatially, institutionally and financially understand how to go about green, green development. So, so this belt concept is actually gaining a lot of traction in our discussions 
with a lot of the international uh, organizations and partners. Development challenges, so in a nutshell, this, this slide shows a little bit of the four key elements of our, our support program for the Yangtze. Degraded river systems, environmental sustainable economic development, unsustainable economic development, so these are the four areas. Slow transition, they, they face a slow transition despite, uh, uh, despite wanting to move towards that direction. Transportation uh, and connectivity, uh, not optimized. So for context, transportation, uh, this, is a, this is a picture here. And you'll see that there are, there are big cargo and big steamships that can navigate all the way up 1,600 kilometers from the coast. That gives you an understanding of the, the, the value of this river system. It's, it's, uh, it's for cheap travel in terms of uh, transportation, transporting goods and, and, and products. But, but it's, it's, also have, it's also having a lot of uh, negative environmental impacts. Increasing pollution pressures, which I mentioned before, and probably the most important, and a lot of the, the emphasis on our projects are now looking at institutional coordination and strategic planning. This is, this is the area that, uh, that the Chinese government has, has tried to seek uh, a lot of uh, overseas input and expertise. So a lot of the work internally in terms of uh, you know, infrastructure, they can fund themselves, but a lot of the work around institu institutional reform uh, models to improve coordination, and we've, we've heard about this in the last three days, you know, uh, cross-boundary, trans-provincial. This is absolutely key because we have 11 provinces across the Yangtze system. And each province is, is as big as many countries. And, and each province are quite powerful in terms of wanting to work together or not. So it's quite significant to be able to, to cut through a lot of the institutional constraints. So that's a, that's a big factor. Environmental challenges. I have alluded to most of these before, but fundamentally a lot of the program that we're working on in the upper basin, in the rural areas, looks at agricultural non-point source pollution. So, you know, sounds, sounds familiar, right? We have, uh, you know, improper use of fertilizers, you know, wastewater collection, forest degradation, reduced water due to climate change and other factors, uh, fragile economy, and this mountain to sea planning approach. So that, that last point is also very important because now they're trying to see how, how we can look at connecting the, the inland areas, the upstream areas, and understanding the linkages down to the sea, to Shanghai. In the, in the international debate at the moment, it's looking at connecting rivers with oceans. Ocean health, solid waste, plastics, this is huge. In fact, the ADB's uh, annual meeting uh, earlier this year that we just announced a big ocean health initiative. And uh, I think the World Bank has come out and done the same. But in all the international forums that we've discussed, it's now ocean health. And, and of course, the oceans are impacted by what flows through the rivers. This is just a, a slide to show a little bit on the water stress. So on top of, on top of all the challenges that we've already faced, you know, we've got the climate change angle. And then another layer coming in. So e even though you've got water stress already, it makes it even worse. And there's predictions under some of the climate change scenarios that the water stressed areas are, are only going to increase, in especially some of the areas that are already quite stressed at the moment in terms of population centers and agricultural uh, development areas. And, and groundwater. That's another, another area that, that, uh, that is hard to, hard, to, uh, hard to get our head around. Now, the next few slides, I just want to spend a bit of time on looking at ADB's program, this uh, integrated framework approach. In, in the past, we've done a lot of projects. There's about $11 billion of work that's been done between 2000 and 2015. But the program has been very unstrategic, has been very ad hoc. So we, we haven't actually focused on any uh, specific uh, strategy. It was basically in the past, they come to us, we have a list of projects, can you help us fund? So we help, us help them fund. So very much a scattergun approach, but this, this shows you, I mean, within the, the Yangtze Basin, across the, these sectors here, identified by these different dots, there's a whole range of things that we've supported. But what we've said is now, we've discussed with the government, there's now an opportunity to work more closely to, to make sure that our, our funding and our, our, our uh, projects are more has more synergies and more strategic and focus. And, and that's, that's the basis of what we call the, the Yangtze, Yangtze Basin Master Plan. And uh, this is the spine, I guess, of our, our, inter our integrated framework approach. Uh, what, we, what we've done here is set ambitious targets. I should say that the government has set ambitious targets, and these targets include uh, improving the environmental quality of the Yangtze River by 2020, 
75% uh, of the water quality has to meet what they call grade three standard. So in China, they've got a grade one to five standard where one is the highest, five is the, the lowest. Three is generally a uh, good enough standard where they can uh, use it for treating, uh, for drinking water. And they also have a target of uh, having forest cover uh, reaching 43%. The, these are not uh, easy targets, but we've seen the, the progress that they've done in the last couple of years anyway. Uh, and they're well on their way to achieve some of these targets. So it's, it's, it's quite uh, humbling and quite uh, impressive to see the work that's been done and the resources being put forward to achieve these issues. Now, for the master plan that they put forward, one of the fundamental things that is going to be critical for, for getting this master plan uh, executed well is legislation. And we are working with them on preparing a Yangtze River Protection Law. And this, this is actually going to have wide-ranging impacts because the law will now give teeth to a lot of the plans, regulations, and guidelines that many of the provinces indeed have. So, so they've got no shortage of uh, guidelines and regulations on what needs to be done, but the law will actually put it, put it to, in a position where it's got teeth. Uh, it's, it's still not easy. We're, we're working with them on the first draft at the moment. We've got a team that's looking at uh, drafting one version of it. Uh, they've asked many teams to draft versions of it. So, so the Chinese are very smart. They've, got, they've, they've spread their expertise and they've got uh, different, different uh, bilateral programs drafting different aspects. So we're supporting them on the ecological and the environmental components. And, and if that gets up, and we're hoping to see a full draft by the end of the year, that will be a big win for getting forward the Yangtze River uh, objectives. This is just another snapshot um, of the program. I won't spend too much time with that, so I'll mention the four different areas. It's a program that runs from 2017 to 2020. We've got about, we've got about uh, I think about 10 or 11 projects in that, in that space. The key elements, uh, as I flagged, we, we have a master plan. Financing. Financing is the next big one. Right now, we've, we've identified that uh, there's a huge financing gap to achieve a lot of the objectives that they've, uh, they've outlined. And this is no different to, to many of the countries that, that we're working in. Public funds can no longer be depended on solely to achieve a lot of these outcomes. And of course, the last one is the last two, I should say, private sector, which, which is also linked into financing and incentives, and uh, public participation. This last one hasn't, been, ha hasn't figured highly uh, in the past, but they're seeing the benefit of public participation stakeholder engagement, and, and I think this message is starting to resonate, and there's a lot of programs now that mandate the requirement to, to, to actually involve the beneficiaries and to build knowledge from the ground up. So now we've got that top-down command and control regulatory framework, but, but now they're seeing that there's a little bit of bottom-up that needs to come into the picture, and, and that's, that's very promising from our, from our viewpoint. This just quickly shows you some of the projects that two billion sort of program looks at. So basically looking at eco-compensation demonstration, watershed, wastewater, green development, agricultural corridors, a whole range of them. And I've got a bit more detail if anybody wants information on these. And they are available on our website, all public. Complementing the lending operations is, uh, is our, what we call obviously non-lending, but uh, this is the focus of our future engagement with China. It's, it's about knowledge. Uh, China doesn't need to borrow from, from us. They don't need to borrow from anyone, actually, but they are engaging with us because of the expertise. They, they see the need to bring knowledge and best practices in the work that they're doing. And, and this, is, this, is, this is shown here. I mean, our, our, a big part of our program, besides the lending, is looking at, we help them with grants to, to design the projects, which we call the feasibility studies. We have a cluster of knowledge uh, projects looking at financing, ecological conservation zones, eco-compensation, which I'll get into uh, further down the line, forestry protection. And we've got a range of platforms for knowledge sharing already in place. Key barriers. Now, this, this, uh, this is something I mentioned before, but uh, you know, there are many rivers, there are many boundaries. The rivers run through the boundaries for many of these places. And of course, this cross-provincial cooperation has been the constraint. If one province is doing a lot of work on one side of the bank and the other side don't, don't do anything, then, then it doesn't work. They need to have some sort of an incentive to make sure that they take a whole basin approach. Financing gaps I mentioned and incentives. And this is where this mechanism comes in. Eco-compensation. 
So what is what is eco-compensation? I'm, I'm not sure many many would have heard about this uh, this idea of eco-compensation. It, it's certainly very much a, a Chinese uh, approach, but it's it's very interesting. I, I presented about this in uh, Stockholm last year at the World Water Week, and, and it gained a lot of interest. Uh, the understanding of upstream downstream tensions, which we heard this morning as well at the keynote. How do we how do we how do we balance those interests, those competing demands? This this uh, this 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 tool, I could say, this instrument holds a lot of promise, and we're we're piloting and experimenting on a lot of programs in China through our projects to try to see how this can work better. This graphic shows, in a very simple form, how how it works. So uh, it's usually focused around upstream downstream relationships, uh, usually around water quality. Upstream providers, the, the custodians of the environmental services, eco ecosystem services, catchment restoration work, and what have you, uh, the communities, they provide ecosystem services to downstream users in terms of improving the water quality. And in turn, the downstream community compensate or pays the upstream. That's, that's a very, very basic uh, uh, way of putting it. But an example I can show you is uh, in, uh, in this this is looks complicated, but essentially what happens is they need to establish incentives to achieve these outcomes. So the first of its kind in China, they, they, they experimented, and the first pilot was in 2011 in the Sinan River. The Sinan River is a river that cuts through two provinces, Anhui and Zhejiang. So that's uh, between Shanghai and, and Huangshan. So that those, those provinces down the, down the western side. Essentially what this, this uh, graphic is saying is they need to get together and agree on a water quality, water quality uh, target. They have to agree where, in terms of the, the, the boundary, where they're going to have that uh, water quality tested. And then there's, in this scheme, they've, they've uh, basically got $16 million in compensation up for grabs if that water quality target is achieved. To sweep the deal, the, the central government is required to come to the table to bring the two provinces together. And, and that's one of the fundamental uh, lessons that's come out of this, this experience and many others. Unless a facilitator or, or somebody, a third party like the central government comes to the table, brings some resources with it, these two provinces have no incentive to work together. And that's, that's some of the learnings that we've had with this program. So this program is now run for <coughs> two iterations, but this water quality metric the, the water quality target gets tightened each year. So, so it gets harder and harder. You've got the you know, law of diminishing returns. And so in the current third iteration, they're still under negotiation to see what, what is, what is the, the water quality target that they're trying to do. But, but in, in simplicity terms and in, in simple logic, it makes sense. If the upstream province achieves the target by managing the catchment well, the downstream catchment, the downstream province pays the upstream uh, catchment or the province, but it doesn't end there. It works the other way around. If that, if that water quality target is not achieved, the upstream province pays the downstream province to defray extra water treatment costs. So, so these incentives work both ways. So in that sense, it's, it's PES, it's a payment sort of scheme, but it's, it's got more incentives for, for them to, to work together and achieve those targets. And that's the, that's the area that we're trying to test. We have the project in, uh, in Anhui province at the moment that builds on the scheme and we've got an element to pilot uh, eco-compensation within the province, which is showing some promise. But a lot of the research on eco-compensation is still within, within the Chinese uh, research literature. Uh, we've got a knowledge project to try, to try to download a lot of that understanding and to try to get a better feel for how they value and how they come up with the, the figures. So that's, that's a work in progress, but we're, we're working with them very closely with the Chinese Academy of Science, the Chinese Academy of Environmental Planning. They're, they're partner, partnering with us on a special policy study. Complementing eco-compensation is the need to work with the private sector. So I, I also mentioned this earlier with the private sector financing. This is an example. This is probably an easy example. Uh, Maltai Liquor Company. Uh, if, you've ever worked in China, you probably know this, uh, this, this hard liquor. It's the, the most famous liquor company in China, and um, it's listed on the stock exchange, in, in the, I think, on, in the US. It's the most valuable liquor company in the world as well. It's very expensive, but this liquor company 
works in one of the tributaries of the Yangtze, in the upper Yangtze, and they, they draw water from the system to make their product. And they can't do this anywhere else. So there are many companies that have come from other countries to try to replicate their, their process to make the liquor, and, and essentially, they, they can't do it. The, the flavor, the, the, the nature of the water, the, the air, the sorghum, it has to be from here. So, so what, what they've now said is they've pledged 73 million over the 10 years with, uh, with the local government to protect upstream uh, ecology and upstream environmental flows. Uh, this is a model because they're trying to bring this in more widely, but the institutional arrangements, the incentives aren't there yet, and the governance frameworks aren't there yet to bring in a lot of the other, a lot of the other big players. They can, they can do it because Maltai has an interest in doing it, a commercial interest. But the plan is to try to scale up with a lot of other pilots. The next, next area is uh, what we call uh, the Natural Capital Lab. Now, this is, this is quite an exciting little, uh, a little uh, initiative uh, because, you know, as, as we heard in, in, uh, in Mara's talk on Monday, uh, you know, with this non-linear change and ad adaptation, we need to experiment. We need to pilot, we need to experiment. And this is, this is in, in the flavor of that experimentation and piloting. So what is this Natural Capital Lab? We're, we're working with a host of uh, partners at the moment to get this up. Stanford University has a Natural Capital Project, which looks at trying to experiment, look, look at new innovations. And now we're trying to take that model and put that in the Yangtze River Economic Belt. So the, the geographic spread of that, that belt is our test bed. We've got a program in place, we've got a two billion program in place, so now we've got that in place. Uh, we've got, we're working with the Nature Conservancy, WWF, and uh, two Chinese academies to try to bring more partners together to tag on to, anchored, anchored on an ADB's program to bring in elements of experimentation. This is exciting, it's just kicking off. We've just uh, flagged this with a lot of our sponsors and a lot of our bilateral partners. We are looking to, Innovate. So it's in a sense a bit of an incubator in that sense. But the, the beauty of this is we already have a program that's coming. So we have a program that we can then partner with specific institutions to trial specific aspects, including eco compensation, including green incentive funds, and including other uh, financial uh, financing modalities to, to try to get some innovations out of out of this uh, program. So this is this is a very exciting little thing that's happening. Knowledge. Knowledge is everywhere, and knowledge is front and center in our program. We've got a range of uh, platforms that we're, we're trying to share in terms of this eco-compensation uh, financing mechanism. Public participation, and uh, I think I've got two more slides, but this is, this is a very important one, as I, as I mentioned before, because uh, there's a growing momentum to involve the, the public, and <laughs> not only at the, at the larger scale, but at the local scale. Now, They've got this new accountability mechanisms around the, the, the river basin management. So they've got river chiefs. They've got this, this idea called river chiefs. They've got bay chiefs, lake chiefs. What this means is that the river system is segmented based on different localities. And usually the officials in those uh, localities, usually the, the mayor or the, the, the party committee member or, or somebody in a, in a very senior position, is provided the responsibility to look after that patch. This is taking local and subsidiarity to a whole different level because these guys are required to meet specific targets in their areas. So for example, the, they've been given specific targets in terms of water quality, uh, forest cover, uh, you know, monitoring of uh, illegal activity. So it also, it, it also brings the community into it because the community is then requested or encouraged to report uh, you know, illegal dumping, uh, you know, bad, bad practices or whatnot. And they've got a very strong system of uh, uh, electronic, uh, I guess using mobile phone network, using, using apps that they can, they can take pictures and they can upload. So, so it's, it's a very strong technology-based solution, but it, it tries to bring that top-down and that bottom-up angle to bring the motivation to get people involved. It's still a work in progress, but uh, it, it's, it's showing a little bit of progress and promise. Now, two more slides. In summary, uh, the Yangtze River Belt is a unique landscape idea, landscape scale idea. It's a mountain to sea approach in terms of what we're trying to do with 
master planning a river basin. It focuses on uh, making sure that green development outcomes can be achieved. I mentioned the legislation aspect to give it some teeth. And then we're talking about piloting and experimenting. So th these are the things that are taking off and uh, the focus of our program. Where to from here? Now this is a nice uh, time to reflect. Um, I've had the privilege to sit into a lot of the sessions over the last couple of days and, and really we, a lot of the issues and a lot of the problems that we're facing in, in our context here in Australia and other countries are, are the same. They are the same issues in China, okay, a lot more, much, much, much bigger scale, but at its heart, a lot of them are still really social problems, social issues. Uh, they're not technical issues. So we heard from, we heard from Peter uh, in the Mercy River. You know, they, they took a long time. They, they worked through a whole process. We, we, we heard from Marcella about India. They talked about the value of community engagement at the local level to bring them forward, to, bring, uh, to look at practical solutions. And of course, this morning, Leith and, Leith and Carleen mentioned uh, the upstream downstream tension, which the eco-compensation tool is trying to, trying to address. Uh, giving a fair go, if you will, that upstream and downstream. But in, in China, it's probably a fair go to the upstream so that they get compensated for the work that they need to do to restrict development, to protect the environment. Leadership, another, another element that's come up. Uh, and leadership, now, and now in China, leadership comes from the top, but we've also seen the benefit of bringing leadership from the bottom. So the, the participatory approach, that's starting to pay some dividends. And, and in fact, the, the government and our counterparts have asked us to make sure that the participation and stakeholder engagement is, is a key focus of a lot of our project work. Now, lastly, before I finish, I just want to add that um, working, working in the Yangtze, and uh, previously I also worked in Sri Lanka on, on some of the river basin and the water supply work, um, the story of the Yangtze, the story of that, that we've heard about in the last couple of days, and, and of course all of the river, river prizes in the last 20 years, it, they're no different. So at its heart, we need to work together. People need to come together to get a, get a, get a joint understanding, joint commitment to move forward. That's easier said than done. Uh, but I think the commitment from, from practitioners like us, uh, researchers, and on the, on the ground experience will be absolutely key to keep the momentum going because governments change. You know, we're, we're lucky in China that this, this government currently under this president may, may be there forever, but, but basically as long as he's focusing on the environment, that's really strong and it's a golden age for us to work. Well, for me, it's been a golden age to work in that, in that sector because there is that support and there is that willingness to push the green agenda because the green development of the Yangtze River Basin will have global implications. And for pollution and for economic development, you've got multinationals across the Yangtze River Belt, you've got Apple, H&M, all the big players, Walmart, their core operations are based in the Yangtze River. They are essentially the factory of the world, and that's, that's no pun. That, that they are really producing, using the system, and making a lot of money from the system. So, that's why the government has seen the Yangtze as one of the key models for them to test green development. Building on the Yangtze, uh, ABB has now been requested to, to turn our attention, in addition to the Yangtze, on an initiative to support the Yellow River. This is going to be a huge program. The Yellow River is very different from the Yangtze. It's much more work, working around water scarcity. The province is a lot more poorer. They recorded 227 days in the 90s where the river did not reach the sea. They've got issues with flood, they've got issues with drought. But this is a very interesting time to be here, to be working in this space, and to be able to bring as much as possible uh, the expertise among, among our uh, river leader network within the Australian water sector network to try to contribute to this ongoing debate. And we are working with the government uh, to try to move this event and get this hosted in China next year. Uh, we will do our best. Uh, it takes, uh, even though we, we've got some, uh, some, uh, some in, uh, avenues to discuss, uh, we're, still, we're still working with them very closely to make sure that uh, the official channels are, uh, 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 are gone through. But we hope, sincerely, and Eva will be working very closely together over the next couple of months, we hope that we can bring this uh, event to China and then see the Chinese profile, look at the Chinese learnings, 
and from uh, Australia to China and all the other countries, try to understand how the river basin experience can be, can be, uh, can be improved. Thank you very much.